You know, I've heard tell that one of the most terrifying sounds that you can hear at a data center is silence. Hey guys, and welcome to Taylor Tech. So while the risk of a home lab going down isn't quite the same as that of a data center going down, it's still something that can be really annoying um, and could potentially even cause some damage. I mean, no one wants to get that call in the middle of the day from their spouse or significant other or kid that, hey, the internet went down and I don't know how to turn it back on. And then you're frantically trying to explain to them how to cold boot a server uh, and get the NAS back up and log into the hypervisor to see if you know, the VM came back up. And all of that can be avoided, though, simply by using an uninterruptible power supply. So the main reason that most people are going to get an uninterruptible power supply is to make sure that the power stays on the, in their lab, even if the power goes off in their home. This can be uh, really handy because it can allow you to keep your internet up for a little bit longer um, in the case of a power outage or just not experience a power outage, at least from your lab standpoint. Um, should your power go off momentarily, which is not entirely uncommon. For most people, it happens a few times a year at least. However, even if you have really uh, reliable power in terms of it not going out, there are still other reasons to uh, get an uninterruptible power supply, one of the primary ones being power quality. Most people don't think about it because power is just power, but there actually is a difference between good quality power that uh, has a reliable frequency and voltage um, versus uh, unreliable power, which may fluctuate in voltage slightly or uh, have a frequency that doesn't quite align with what it's supposed to. Improving the power quality in your lab can actually have a huge impact on the lifespan of your uh, the components in your lab. Uh, poor power quality can cause things to burn out much faster than they normally would, um, especially when you're talking about overvoltage. And finally, one of the last reasons that a lot of people will put an uninterruptible power supply in their lab is to get a better handle on how much power their lab is actually using. Um, the vast majority of uh, enterprise-grade uh, UPSs are going to provide power metering as well as uh, you know the, all of the other benefits of a UPS. So when you're going to select a power supply for your lab or your home PC, the first thing that you need to realize is they're not necessarily spec'd out in terms of the runtime of the UP of the device on your UPS, but rather they're spec'd out in terms of the maximum amount of power that they supply. Remember, they're not only providing an uninterruptible power supply, they're providing a better power supply, so they have a lot of components in them. So they not only have you know, the batteries in them and the transformers to uh, take the power from the batteries and uh, provide it to your lab, they also have components in them to provide a clean power supply. And those are the components that are gonna be used the most. So um, you know, the, power, the uninterruptible power supply is, is being rated in how much power it can provide at a given time to your lab. When you look at the ratings on power supplies or on <clears throat> when you look at the ratings on UPSs, you'll notice that they often aren't given in terms of the watts that they uh, can provide. Although that's what you usually see power supplies on electronic components stating is the number of watts they pull. They actually UPSs are generally rated in terms of volt amps. Volt amps are kind of a simpler measure of power than watts and a little bit uh, more consistent in terms of measuring between different types of devices. It's simply the number of amps that the device draws times the number of watts, or I'm sorry, the number of volts. So a 5 amp device that draws 110 volts is a 550 volt amp device. The important thing to remember is that wattage and volt amperage are not the same thing, so you can't just add up the wattage of your lab. You actually have to understand a little bit more. Look, it'll, every, power devi every device in your lab should list how many amps it's drawing so that you can get a good idea of how many volt amps uh, your lab will be drawing and get a power supply that will at least meet that. Generally speaking, you want to make sure that you have some headroom on your power supply or on your UPS and that you're not maxing it out. Um, you know, while a 3000 volt amp power supply can uh, provide 3000 volt amps of power, it's not going to be efficient at 3000 volt amps. Um, it's going to be drawing more than that from the wall. Whereas if it's only providing, you know, 1500 volt amps of power, it's going to be much more efficient. So if you're a little bit unsure of exactly how to size it, simply just get a sheet of paper, write down the amperage and the voltage of every single device in your lab that's going to be attached to this UPS, s multiply them out, sum them all up, um, and that'll tell you the minimum that you want. I would aim for ideally that being about 60% of the UPS's volt amperage. If you're going to be like me and you're going for a used enterprise grade UPS, there are a few things that you need to consider beyond just the size of the UPS. Um, 
the one is that the batteries in them may be older. Um, UPSs are battery powered devices and just like any other battery powered device, um, eventually the batteries go bad and they have to be replaced. The batteries can be relatively expensive. They're extremely heavy. They're not going to be fun to ship. So um, you want to make sure that uh, either you're getting a good enough price on it, having to replace the batteries, or the batteries are in decent shape. Um, another thing to consider is that while most homes are going to have primarily 110 or 120 volt power in the U.S., um, most UPSs in the enterprise world are not necessarily going to be 110 volt. Um, you'll see 240 volt uh, relatively frequently, and you'll also see 208 volt, um, which is not uh, standard single phase power like you see in most homes. It's actually three phase power, which is really uncommon. I, I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb and say you probably don't have that in your home. Um, it's very common in the data center world to have three phase power because it's more efficient when you have large power draws. Um, but it's not something you're going to see in your home. And uh, while you can get an electrician out to run a 240 volt plug to uh, over to your lab if you really want to, and it's not going to be that expensive, you can't just run a three phase line from your existing power box. It's a different line that has to be drawn from your utility company, um, or you have to get a power inverter. And I can almost guarantee you that you're not getting enough good a good enough deal on that UPS to pay the several hundred dollars for an inverter to convert single phase to three phase or uh, to pay the thousands upon thousands of dollars to have your utility company run a new line out to your house for three-phase power. So just keep that in mind. If it has five prongs on the plug, it is three-phase. There's no getting around it. Please, you know, just be careful. Make sure you avoid three-phase. You're not going to have a fun time trying to get that to work in a, a normal residential home. So now you may notice um, that I'm not standing in front of my table. I don't have my UPS up there on it with me. Uh, and part of that is because UPSs are universally very, very heavy. I was actually afraid that the thing was going to damage my table just by setting it up on it. It's going to scratch the, cr the crud out of it because I swear the thing weighs 80 to 100 pounds. Um, the UPS that I have is an APC Smart UPS 3000. It's a data center grade UPS. It's a 30 amp draw from the wall. Um, and are capable of up to 30 amp draw from the wall. Uh, it's 110 volt uh, power, and um, it can power pretty much a full rack if you wanted to uh, and keep it running for a few minutes, or it could power a much smaller lab for half an hour to an hour, depending on exactly how uh, much stuff you have running and how much power it's drawing. So as I mentioned, UPSs are universally very, very heavy. Um, part of this is because they have... You, generally speaking, very large lead-acid batteries in them, but also they have uh, transformers to convert DC power to AC power at a level that can power your entire home lab. There's are some pretty heavy electrical components when you think about it. Um, so because of that, a lot of larger UPSs, especially rack-mountable ones, have removable batteries, and I highly recommend that you remove those batteries before you uh, go about trying to install your UPS. Um, in my case, the batteries were about half the weight of the device, so about 40 to 50 pounds. It's funny, actually, when I took the battery out, it actually had the team lift symbol on just the battery module. Um, and they weren't kidding. It was freaking heavy. I, I, I almost dropped it coming down the stairs um, because it's just so compact and dense with those giant lead acid batteries in them. Giant. Anyway, so because of that extreme weight, not only do you want to remove the battery pack before you get to moving your UPS around, you also want to make sure that you mount it at the very bottom of your rack. I'm talking the lowest rack mount slots in your rack. The reason for this is to make sure that you're not making your rack top heavy and uh, more likely to tip in the case that you need to move it. Um, by mounting it at the bottom, you're putting all that heavy ballast at the bottom and making your rack have a lower center of gravity. So if you do have to move it, it's going to be more stable. So once you get your UPS in your rack physically, the first thing you'll want to do is make sure that it it's working correctly. Um, in fact, I'd actually highly recommend doing this before you even put it in your rack because if you get it in there and it's not working, you're not going to have a fun time getting it back out. So definitely make sure you plug your UPS in, make sure it turns on and gives you, you know, uh, if it's got a little LCD screen or something like that, it gives you a reading and everything is looking good before you move forward. In terms of moving things over from the wall to the UPS, you kind of have a few options. You can just cold shut everything down, replug everything in and go. Um, but for most devices in your lab, you probably have dual power supplies, um, you know, uh, redundant power supplies. So what I would recommend doing is, uh, getting two power strips, 
having one power strip be all of the uninterruptible or all of the redundant power supplies on one side of every device in your lab. The second power strip be all of the redundant power supplies on the other side of the devices in your lab. And then move the power strips over one at a time into the UPS um, with the UPS on and running. What this will do is it'll keep those devices from shutting off. That way you'll have no downtime other than maybe the handful of things that don't have redundant power supplies. In the case of devices that don't have redundant power supplies, leave them on one of the power strips. And I would highly recommend leaving all of them on the same power strip. Shut them all down uh, it, in a controlled fashion and then move that power strip over and bring it back online. So you can move everything over to your UPS immediately as soon as you get it plugged in uh, and verify that it's working. Um, but don't expect it to provide that uninterruptible part of the power supply immediately. Generally speaking, it's probably going to be need some time to charge up, especially if it hasn't been used in a while. Um, and you, you'll want to make sure that it, it gets a full charge before you try and test it to make sure that it's giving you an uninterrupted power supply. Now, a lot of the UPSs out there, especially those higher-end enterprise ones that you can find used relatively cheap, um, are going to have functionality to both test the batteries and uh, calibrate the batteries to the specific load that's on them. And this is something that I highly recommend that you do once you get everything converted over. It doesn't help to do that, that self-test and that calibration until it actually has a load on it, because it has to have that load to make sure the battery is actually functioning. So once you get your lab moved over, um, I highly recommend you do the self-test function first to make sure the batteries are good. And then once you've done the self-test, let it fully charge two to four hours um, until it's at 100% and then do the calibration on it to make sure that you're getting an accurate readout of how much battery life you have left and how long your lab is going to be online in the case of a power outage. In my case, um, with the smart UPS, essentially what it does is it just runs the batteries all the way to zero um, until it has to kick back over to the wall power supply. Um, and then it uses that to gauge how the life of the battery and uh, how long it's actually going to help the lab run. Um, and I found that prior to calibrating it, it was horrible at measuring the life of the battery that looked like it was dropping to zero instantly when it really I still had juice left. But after calibration, it actually did a really good job of uh, giving me an accurate readout of the battery life and how much longer I had until it was going to lose power. So UPSs, um, as we mentioned earlier, are not exactly maintenance-free. It is something that you have to keep up with, uh, like any other device in your lab. Um, as with all batteries, the batteries do die over time. Um, since they're lead-acid batteries, they tend to be a little bit more durable than like a lithium-ion battery or something like that. Um, generally speaking, you'll probably get four to five years of use out of it, depending exactly on how much the UPS is having to kick on. Um, if you have really crappy power in your area and it goes out quite frequently, you may only get two or three years out of it. Whereas if you have really good power and it hardly ever goes out, you'll get the full four or five. Um, when it comes time to replace it, make sure you replace it with the batteries meant for your UPS. Generally speaking, they're all 12 volt lead acid batteries, but um, different batteries have different load factors on them. They charge at different rates. Uh, if you put the wrong batteries in there, you could be setting yourself up for failure. Uh, and not just like a little whoopsie failure, but like, we're talking fires, we're talking uh, the UPS burning itself out and shutting everything off or potentially sending a surge uh, through your devices and killing them. So really make sure you're using the right batteries for your device. So the last thing that you may want is to expand the capacity of your UPS. Uh, in my case, I only get about 30 minutes of runtime, uh, probably because of that giant Cisco switch that is just sucking power like it's going out of style. Um, if you want more runtime, there are Definitely ways to do that. Um, a lot of the enterprise UPSs do have expansion modules that hook directly into the UPS and that can give you double or more runtime. And that's a great thing. Um, and some people out there have also experimented with using just 12 volt car batteries, which it's possible. Um, you know, again, most UPSs run in a multiple of 12. It's either 12, 24, or 48 volt power that it needs from the batteries. But you can run into unintended consequences. Again, uh, not only can you damage your UPS, potentially damage your equipment that the UPS is powering, you actually could also cause a real fire, like a real house fire or explosion. Because uh, as lead-acid batteries charge, especially automotive lead-acid batteries, they give off hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas is what was in the Hindenburg. You don't want your house to turn into the Hindenburg. So make sure you do your homework if you want to do something like that. 
I personally am not going to do anything like that. I feel like it's just too dangerous and not worth messing with. If my lab goes offline, oh well. Um, you know, I don't need to set up all sorts of crazy ventilation and stuff just to get an extra two or three hours of runtime out of my lab. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. Um, I certainly feel much more comfortable having my home lab with a UPS on it now. So if the power does go out, it's not likely to take the lab down with it. Um, and you know, we still have Wi-Fi in the house for at least a few minutes uh, once the power goes out. If you like this video, hit that like button. Also, subscribe for more content like this in the future. If you have any questions or comments for me, you can leave them in the comment section down below. And if you'd like to support what I'm doing on this channel, you can click the Amazon affiliate link in the description. Alright guys, thanks for watching. Have a good one.